welcome to our afternoon growth point service. Let's begin with the banner of the cross. birthdays this week so let's go to the Lord in prayer and we'll pray for the service here Lord we thank you for this opportunity Lord to gather again today Lord be it virtually or in person we thank you for that Lord we ask you Lord to help us Lord with these technical difficulties that we've experienced this morning Lord we pray that your message would go forth uh, regardless of these technical difficulties we ask you Lord to to give us wisdom and help us Lord to uh, understand how to communicate these things to uh, this world around us, Lord, and we just thank you, Lord, for the opportunity, um, Lord, to just do our best, Lord, to worship you today in spite of these challenges and difficulties. We ask for your encouragement, we ask for your spirit to dwell in our hearts, Lord, and, and lift up our voices for us, Lord, uh, as we sing. Lord, we praise you and we thank you in Jesus' precious name, amen. Savior, like a shepherd, lead us.
All right, take your Bibles, please, and turn to the book of 1 Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. I'm going to continue where we left off last week here in our Growth Point service. We are looking at a passage of Scripture where the Spirit of God has led the Apostle Paul to really uh, begin to do some defense of his ministry, uh, those that are with him there in the city of Thessalonica. And, uh, and so he is really... Uh, making it clear, kind of laying out a case for uh, the ministry they had among the people. And uh, in fact, in verse 1, uh, the Lord begins here, the Lord has Paul begin with, for yourselves, brother, know our entrance unto you, that it was not in vain. And he's saying, you know what, you know how we came, how we preached the gospel to you. You know that God worked um, and that many people came to Christ. And, and of course, there's a growing and thriving ministry that is going on uh, because of what God did there. Um, and so in the context, in the content of these verses here, verses 1 through 6, what we find then are uh, various hallmarks of God's true biblical servants. And this would be in contrast to the pretenders, to the con artists, to just people that are just kind of out in, in it for themselves. And, and uh, there are certainly... Uh, a number of false teachers in that day that were peddling all sorts of things. And, and, and Paul says, you know what? We have, we're not anything like that. And uh, you know uh, the ministry we had with you. You knew how effective it was. And so in this passage, we find these characteristics, these hallmarks of true biblical servants. And um, I want to read through the verses. And uh, then we want to uh, kind of pick back up where we left off last week. So verse 1. 1 Thessalonians 2 and verse 1, For yourselves, brother, know our entrance unto you, and unto you that it was not in vain, but even after that we had suffered before, we were shamefully entreated. As you know, at Philippi, we were bold in our God to speak unto you the gospel of God with much contention. For our exhortation was not of deceit, nor of uncleanness, nor in guile, but as we were allowed of God to be put in trust with the gospel, even so we speak. Not as pleasing men, but God which trieth our hearts. For neither at any time use we flattery words, as ye know, nor a cloak of covetousness. God is witness. Nor of men sought we glory, neither of you, nor yet of others, when we might have been burdensome as the apostles of Christ. So, let's just kind of review a little bit. Last week we noted that one of the hallmarks of a, a true biblical servant is they are bold in God. They are bold in God. Verse 2, we see that by God's grace, Paul and those that were with him were bold in our God to speak and do the, mis uh, under the, go the gospel of God with much contention. And so this supernatural boldness, the supernatural confidence in the Lord, particularly in face of the opposition that they faced. And then secondly, secondly, another hallmark is lo loyalty to the truth. Loyalty to the truth. Paul could not be scared off of his message and testimony. And uh, he did not speak falsehoods. He did not uh, give uh, error of any kind. He only spoke the truth. And uh, a very major contrast between others who were peddling all sorts of things, as I mentioned, uh, but there was no, no deceit, right? In verse 2, verse 3, our exhortation was not of deceit, nor of uncleanness, nor guile. There was there's no impure motives behind what he was speaking about. There's just clarity. And, you know, when we think about serving the Lord, uh, you know, we're not doing it for ourselves. We're not doing it uh, to get noticed. We're not doing it so others will think highly of us. Our service to the Lord is exactly that. We're actually we're serving God. We're, we're serving God um, because we have been called by Him. We feel responsibility uh, to, to do that, to carry out. Uh, the mission that he's called us to. And uh, it's not a matter of we're doing it for show, we're doing it for something we can get out of it. It really comes down to the call of God upon our life. And that goes right into 
our third hallmark that we see here, and that is approved of God. Approved of God. We looked at this at verse 4, but we were allowed of God to be put in trust with the gospel. And the Lord uh, here uh, is the one who kind of validated Paul and, and approved him for the gospel ministry. The Bible says here that he was put in trust with the gospel. And those words uh, ought to really sober us up, ought to really cause us to think about the seriousness of this and, and the Apostle Paul and those with him. And really, frankly, we look, look at uh, the Great Commission uh, there in Mark chapter 16, verse 15. God says, uh, Jesus says, uh, that we are to preach the gospel to every creature. And, and uh, all of us have therefore uh, been given, we've been entrusted with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And, you know, you've heard it said before, it's true. The Lord could have chosen to get the gospel message out any way that he chose to. But in his perfect wisdom and his sovereignty, um, he chose to commission each one of us. He chose to put us in trust with the gospel. And Paul says, you know what? God entrusted us with the gospel. And, uh, and so, uh, even so we speak. Even so we speak. You know, would that, would, would that be our testimony as God's people? That we uh, would take seriously our, um, our calling by God, to, to our proving by God to um, be a servant in the work of the Lord. And that brings us then to today's um, message in Ephesus. As we continue these hallmarks, we see next that a servant of God is accountable to the Lord. Is accountable to the Lord. Look there at verse 4. Verse 4. Uh, Paul says that uh, they're entrusted with the gospel even so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God which trieth our hearts. For neither at any time use we flattering words, as you know, nor a cloak of covetousness, God is witness. And those words, God is witness, are strong words. To say, you know what? God saw us. God uh, is witness of how we behaved before you, of how we served the Lord. Uh, and as we taught you, as we discipled you, as we uh, preached uh, the gospel to you. And um, we see here that uh, those that are serving the Lord, true servants of God, they, they are conscious of their accountability to God. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, we talked about the fact that uh, this church, the church that Christ is building, there is a sense where we are, the scripture actually says it, we're co-laborers with God in that. And uh, the Bible calls upon us there in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 that every man ought to take heed how he builds upon the foundation of Jesus Christ. And, and again, talking about in that metaphor of building and our work of the ministry of the church. And so we need to recognize, and God's servants realize, that it's really about the Lord. It's what matters to Him. It matters to Him. And so this idea of, of really pleasing the Lord, and um, that's a, I didn't review that one, but we're pleasing to the Lord and um, understanding that um, we are not... Uh, doing things uh, for show, we're not doing things for other people, but we recognize that we're striving to please God uh, because we love Him and we want to obey Him and we're accountable to Him and we know it, and we know it. In fact, <clears throat> this whole idea, uh, the Old Testament speaks much about living with the, as in the fear of the Lord. And, and again, we're not, we're not fearing God as it were to that we would not be able to approach Him but the fear of the Lord really has the idea of is that we have a conscious understanding from the Word of God that we are accountable to God for everything in our life, how we, um, how we think, uh, how we speak, what we do, and so on and so forth. And God's servants know, they know that they're accountable to God. Paul states in verse 4 that God trieth our hearts. That is, He examines our hearts. He examines our hearts. And uh, often when Paul had to defend his ministry, he made it clear that he was fully aware of this accountability to the Lord. He says, you know what? I know uh, that um, my life is on display before God. In fact, all of our lives are on display before God. God knows our hearts. He knows our motives. 
he sees what we do or don't do. And, um, and so those that are serving God, and this is exactly what God would have us to be striving toward, is that we recognize this and that we would have this understanding. That, you know what? God is witness. God is witness. And um, we are to be seeking to please him. We are understanding that we are accountable to God. And therefore, by implication, we are going to step it up. In fact, what's that mean? What's that mean? Well, uh, right there in the passage, verse 5, neither at any time use me flattering words, nor a cloak of covetousness. You say, you know what? We're not trying to trick anybody. We're not trying to pull the wool over anyone's eyes. Uh, we're, we're not um, uh, being sneaky in what we do. You know, uh, it's not anything about that. We could go on to talk about the fact that it's not a power play, you know, it has nothing to do with that. It's simply, here we are, we're just messengers of truth, messengers of the Word of God, and um, we're simply understanding that we are accountable to the Lord. So, didn't use flattering words. He didn't come in making compliments with the intent to deceive or exploit the people. Um, and of course, there's all kinds of false teachers that will tell you just about anything you want to hear. And others will water down the truth so you'll accept them. But Paul and those that were laboring with him, they didn't have anything to do with that, right? In fact, they came declaring, thus saith the Lord. And you know what? Truth offends. I mean, the gospel does uh, confront people where they live. It confronts their sin. And, uh, you know, there can be a tendency to, eh, let's kind of water it down a little bit. Let's overemphasize some things and, and de-emphasize other things to make it a little bit more palatable. And again, we ourselves are not to be offensive, right? We ought not be angry and, and upset, and we ought not, you know, ourselves come across in a brash, uh, unloving way. That would not be um, the way that we present the gospel. We don't uh, come to a fellow brother and sister in Christ and and we don't, uh, we're not mean toward them. We're not angry at them and in the sense of, uh, you know, kind of you better get this and, and uh, just kind of that way. There, there's obviously uh, love and a kindness and so forth. But the reality is that God would have us uh, to give truth. And truth uh, can be painful sometimes. You know, we, we, use the, we use the idea of somebody getting their toes stepped on. And, uh, you know, when the word of God is preached and taught, if it's, you know, if we're really listening and it's clearly communicated, there's going to be times when it's going to step on our toes. Why? Because it's hitting home. It's hitting home. And we realize, you know what? Mm, that's an area of my life that I need to deal with. That's an area of my life. There's sin there that needs to be confessed and, and forsaken. Uh, Paul goes on to say that they did not come with a cloak of covetousness. That is a pretext for greed. Uh, someone writes this, Paul and his companions did not come to Thessalonica with a cloak hiding greedy intentions. They were not at all like the spiritual deceivers who come cloaking their real desires for sexual favors and money, using flattery to win over their audience and then exploiting them for all sorts of personal satisfaction and gain. Uh, in fact, in Acts chapter 20, in verse 33, Paul says, I have coveted no man's silver or gold or apparel. Yet yourselves, you yourselves know that these hands have ministered unto my necessities and to them that are with me. And again, we see that uh, the servant of the Lord understands that he is accountable to God. God is witness. God sees what he's doing, knows what he's doing. We're not going to come in sort of a fake way, but there's just an openness, a transparency um, as the servant of the Lord. And then the last thing we want to draw our attention to, the last hallmark that we want to consider uh, here in verse 6 is committed to God's glory. Why are we doing what we're doing? Ultimately, why are we doing? Well, certainly there uh, is the reason that we come presenting truth, preaching. Why do we do ministry every week? Because we want to see people come to Christ and because we want to see believers grow in their walk with God, grow in their relationship with the Lord. Um, you know, my heart's desire is for all of us that we grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ, and uh, that we'd be obedient to God, that we would be a people 
that love the Lord with all our heart, soul, strength, and mind, and our neighbor um, uh, as ourselves, and that we would be making disciples who make disciples. But ultimately, all of this is for the Lord. Ultimately, all of it is for the Lord. And so unlike the common spiritual deceivers who are in it for themselves, Paul did not come seeking his own fame and glory. In other words, his ministry was not all about Paul, right? His ministry was all about, was all about Jesus. His, all, his ministry was all about, thus saith the Lord. His ministry was all for the glory of God. In other words, Paul came saying, this is who the Lord is, and the scriptures tell us who the Messiah is, and Jesus is the Messiah. And uh, that's what he was all about. That's what the ministry was all about. And frankly, you know, again, by the grace of God, that is what I'm striving to regularly communicate. And I certainly want to have a pure heart and a motive for why I do what I do every single week. It's certainly not about me. It's certainly about Jesus. And every single one of us, we ought to be thinking and we ought to be, we ought to be prayerfully striving to make sure that our ministry for the Lord is always about the Lord and not about us, not about us. And um, I tell you, Paul was not seeking any kind of glory. He didn't want esteem or honor or praise from others. Um, I remember it's been years ago, but I came across, I don't know if I saw this, um, you know, on a television screen a long time ago as I was uh, looking and there may have been uh, at a hotel or something, um, you know, some evangelist that was preaching or maybe it was online, I don't remember. But, uh, you know, he got up to preach and I, I only looked at it for a couple of seconds really, but as he got up to preach, you know, behind his head was his name and it was so-and-so ministries. And, um, you know, I don't know if it was intentional. Maybe it wasn't intentional. Maybe it was a big organization. Maybe he didn't even, wasn't even the one who put it up there. I don't really know. But I looked at that and I kind of cringed. I thought, you know, I would never, never, never want to be proclaiming the name of Christ and have my name kind of in a prominent place. That's just, that, that's just not anything that we would have anything to do with. And, and certainly we would not want anything to do with that. Someone writes, Paul did not habitually seek accolades, applause, awards, recognition, and prestige either from the Thessalonians or from others. Now, you know, sadly, this kind of, um, this kind of thinking and attitude can kind of creep in. And I think that there have been occasions when God's people, um, you know, maybe it's a subtle thing. Maybe it just kind of slips in there. You know, our hearts are deceitful, desperately wicked, right? But I think there can be times when, you know, maybe we do something uh, in the church. Maybe we minister in a certain way. And, you know, maybe nobody really says anything, you know? Now, it's nice to say thank you, and we ought to do that. And, and um, you know, people can always grow and get better at doing that, being more aware of that. But I'll tell you, I think sometimes we could get into a place where, you know, we serve the Lord, we do some things for people in the ministry, and eh, nobody thanks us. Nobody recognizes us. Nobody says, hey, I, you know, I know you took all that time to do such and such, and, and you know, that's really great. And honestly, there's an appropriateness to that, right? Uh, give honor where honor is due, and, and we ought to do that kind of thing. However, I feel like we could very easily, very subtly kind of slip into uh, the wrong kind of attitude, the wrong kind of thinking, because we feel like we have to have that. It's like we feel like we were slighted or we get offended because nobody said thank you or nobody recognized us or nobody applauded. Now, we don't want anybody to really apply, applaud, but, but we might kind of like it a little bit if somebody said some nice things about us or at least recognized what we did. And, uh, you know, um, again, there's an appropriateness for that in its place but that ought not be why we're doing what we do. That ought not be what we're seeking after, to be noticed and to be recognized and to have people thank us. Uh, instead, 
All that we do ought to be for the glory and praise of God. All that we do ought to be for the glory and praise of God. And it is my heart, it really is my heart, that every single week when we gather for worship here in this place, that each of us would leave praising the Lord Jesus Christ for his word and the truth that has been proclaimed. You know what? That's the most important. Jesus is the most important. Ephesians 3 verse 20, Now unto him that is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that worketh in him in, uh, in us, unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Listen, I, I bring this up a lot, I know, and uh, I trust you don't get tired of this, but out there in that sign right outside the door was our mission here at Lighthouse. Making and maturing disciples of Jesus Christ to the glory of God. That is why we do what we do. That is what we are all about here in the ministry. And so hallmarks of God's servants. These are a few hallmarks that we see. There's actually some other characteristics that we see here as well, and uh, perhaps we'll get to them in a later message. Let's go ahead and close in prayer. Father, thank you for the privilege once again to look to your word. I pray you'd help us to be people that are defined, that are characterized by your word. May the word of God direct us. May the word of God influence us to be people that line up with your values and your priorities. Lord, may we be your children that are pleasing to you. We'll praise you and thank you for all you do in Jesus' name. Amen.